All right, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody had an awesome uh, last few days, uh, four-day four day weekend, was it? I hope that everybody really got to enjoy some family time. And uh, if you didn't, get with the program. <laughs> uh, the last couple of days have been pretty awesome um, as far as just having some downtime to get to hang out and not really have any obligations. Uh, I didn't have anywhere to go or anywhere to be and... That's just awesome to have every once in a while, you know? And uh, God is good. God is good. I'm, I got a whole bunch of stuff to talk about. <clears throat> I hope that we can get through it. I'm, uh, I'm going to talk to you guys today, but really when I was putting all this stuff together, the Lord was really, really, really ministering to me. So uh, not only am I going to be talking to y'all, I'll be talking to myself. And... Uh, God is good. God is good. You know, uh, sometimes, sometimes everything isn't what it's always cracked up to be. You know, uh, I seen a thing this week. It made me, made me really think about stuff. I, I seen a thing that said, you know, um, nobody has to pretend to be depressed, but a lot of us have to pretend to be happy. And that really rocked me because I can't tell you how many times when I've uh, been feeling pretty down and out, pretty bummed out, and I put a smile on my face and try to make it seem like everything's okay. And it made me think, how many of my friends, how many of my family, how many people that I go to church with do that same thing? You know, it's, uh, it's sometimes easier to put a smile on our face and act like everything's okay than it is to be real with one another. And I don't know if that's the uh, inability to be vulnerable with each other, or if that's just some kind of a defense mechanism uh, to try to hard, or try to, try to hide our feelings or emotions. I don't know what it is, but I know it's ridiculous. Um, and, and, uh, a handful of you guys know that, uh, I've been going through the ringer since about, uh, August, about the middle of August and, uh, and it hasn't been pleasant and it hasn't been fun and, uh, I'm just really grateful. I'm really grateful for friends, for church members, for brothers and sisters in Christ that have grace, uh, for me that I do get the opportunity occasionally to be real and to be vulnerable and um, I'm super grateful for Nathan. Nathan and uh, Brittany this week really, really encouraged me. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but I'm just going to shoot you straight. There's times where it's all that I can do. It feels like I'm hanging on by a thread. There's times where I just want to give up and go, is this really worth it? I mean, I got saved, and it was amazing. I was going to heaven. I thought I was going to heaven. That was the whole purpose that I got saved. You know, it wasn't to have a relationship with God or to have a relationship with you. It's because I wanted to go to heaven. <laughs> and then the Lord was like, okay, I'll save your soul when you get to go to heaven. And then he started this work within me. And, it, and at first it was pretty easy, but it seems like the closer you walk with the Lord, the more he, serious he is about your holiness, about your purity, about your submission to him and his plans and his purposes. And you come to a crossroads where it's like, Oh my gosh, it really is you living in me. I really have to submit and surrender my whole life to what you want to do. It's no longer about my hobbies. It's no longer about my feelings. It's about advancing your kingdom. It's about, <laughs> you've laid your life down for me, and I'm going to lay my life down for you. And we get misunderstood Things get misconstrued, things get blowed out of context. You know, it, it seems like no matter how much I try to pull back and pull away and isolate myself from all things and all people, the enemy has this weird way of showing up. <laughs> he shows up when you least expect it. I, I, I've, I've, I have very little communication with just about anybody anymore, and it just never stops, whether it's through business or whether it's an attack on my daughter or whether it's a misunderstanding or whether it's assumption, it's just out of control. And so I'm really grateful, first of all, God for you, Jesus for your grace, and secondly, for my wife, who can, I don't even know how she puts up with me, and, and third, for my brothers and sisters that Man, it ain't no joke. This ain't no game. There's times when it's not all fun. And there's times when we need each other to lift each other up. 
that we need each other to pray for each other. But you got to be open and honest and vulnerable because if you're not open and honest with me, I don't know how to pray for you. If you put a smile on your face and I think everything's great, why would I pray for you? But if you shoot me straight and go, man, this has been a rough week, I could really use some encouragement. I had a brother just last night shoot me a message and said, man, I don't know why, but all of a sudden I'm feeling depressed. Can you pray for me? And I, that, that, I felt honored by that, that he felt close enough to me that he could ask for prayer. And I did. I stopped what I was doing and I lifted him up in prayer. And I think that's what it's going to take and that's what's required of us to be brothers and sisters in Christ, to be some of y'all are older than me or, or, or mother figures and father figures. And then some of you are younger than me that are like, my sons and my daughters, and then you got people that are my age or close to me that are brothers and sisters. But loving each other, we have to be vulnerable. We have to understand that I'm not here to hurt you and you're not here to hurt me. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And Jesus, he came to give life and give life more abundantly. So let's just, I just want to thank you guys. Thank you for allowing me to be me. Thank you for putting up with me and thank you for praying for me. So, with that being said, uh, the, the, this, this title, I've been working on a title because my friend who's out of town is always asking me to give her a title, and I'm not that great with it, but I do have a title for this. It's called The Waiting Game. So uh, this message will be called The Waiting Game. And uh, so one of the worst feelings in life is to wait. <laughs> How did that make you feel? How did that make you feel? Was you guys like, well, what are you going to say? No, no, no. I don't think I've ever run into somebody that says, man, I'm so excited to wait. <laughs> never, never, ever, ever. I don't think I've ever met anybody that's like, man, I just really love waiting. I see that as I'm in line at uh, the local stores. <laughs> I'm just so thrilled to stand there. Uh, the reality is, is none of us like to wait. And, uh, you know, one of the worst feelings in life is to wait, but it's especially tough to wait when we're waiting on God, when we're waiting on God. Um, a lot of us right now, we're, we're waiting on the Lord uh, to answer our prayers. We're waiting on Him to respond. Um, you know, your prayers may sound like um, something like this, Lord, I ask that you would save my friend's soul. I have people that I dare to call friends that don't know Jesus. I have family members that I reluctantly call family members <laughs> that I don't think that they know Jesus, but I love them enough to ask the Lord to save their soul. Um, Lord, I ask that you would fix my marriage. I know that everybody in here don't have that problem. Everybody in here has a magnificent marriage. But every once in a while, i got to ask the Lord to help me <laughs> Or maybe i got to ask the Lord to help Susie <laughs> with me. <laughs> or, uh, Lord, will you please fix my children? <laughs> I mean, I don't know if any of y'all have children, but have you ever had to ask that? I mean, my children are amazing most of the time. <laughs> and that sometimes when they're not amazing, i got to ask the Lord to fix them. Or, Lord, please help. I mean, just the cry of our heart, that simple, Lord, please help. We're so bombarded with negativity, that we don't even have the words to express the things we want to say, and we can only say, Lord, help. Or, Lord, please heal our nation. Lord, heal our nation. You know, we want to be a sheep nation, Lord. We want to be a nation, a nation that was founded upon your truths, your principles, your love, your word. Lord, bring us back. Bring us back to putting you first. Lord, I'm asking you for provision or for finances, I can't tell you how many times I lived paycheck to paycheck and I really needed the Lord to come through or I was going to be in a rough spot. And, uh, and there's times that he has come through and there's times that he hasn't. But that doesn't mean that he loves me any less. That doesn't mean that he loves you any less. So uh, sometimes the Lord answers immediately and sometimes there's nothing. Sometimes it's just like cricket, cricket, <laughs> cricket. Sometimes we get the opportunity to wait, and uh, that's a funny way to look at it. Have you ever considered the opportunity to wait? I don't feel like that's a very good opportunity that I want to participate in, but maybe it's just me. 
But, uh, you know, if, if we've had those uh, prayers, you know, and we've had the opportunity to wait, sometimes it can begin over time to sound a little something like this. Our prayers change from, Lord, will you save my family member's soul? Lord, will you give me provision? Lord, will you take care of me? Lord, will you heal our nation? You know, sometimes if we don't hear something from the Lord, our prayers begin to sound something like this. Now, I can't put this on you, so sometimes my prayers begin to sound something like this. God, what's taking so long? God, what's taking so long? You know, uh, have you forgotten about my requests? <laughs> Lord, did you even hear me? Did you hear me at all? Do you even care? Do you even care? Do you see how the progression goes down so fast? So fast to uh, what's taken so long to did you hear me to you don't even love me, do you? Because you're not giving me what I requested. Is that a twisted way to think? <clears throat> I want you guys to know that yes, he does care. He has showed me he has showed me time and time again, and, and, and this week was no exclusion. He showed me this week that he does care. And that he might not have answered my prayers, but he gave me exactly what I needed, exactly when I needed it. He gave me just the right encouragement to keep me holding on, to keep me believing in his promises, to keep me believing in his plans and in his purposes. Yes, <clears throat> he heard not only your voice, but he heard you from the innermost parts of your being. See, it's one thing to verbally pray, but he knows our hearts. He knows our hearts. He heard not only what we verbalized, but he heard the things we have not verbalized. And no, he hasn't forgotten about my requests, and he hasn't forgotten about your requests. He hasn't. But it sometimes seems the more that we pray, the less we hear. The more we pray, the less we see. It's almost like a conundrum. It's like, Lord, I thought you wanted me to rely on you, but when I rely on you, you quit talking. <laughs> and when I rely on myself, you talk a lot. How exactly does this work? And uh, it's just wild. It's just wild. And sometimes I'm left going, Lord, where are you? And, uh, you know, it was fun. It was fun. It was really awesome back in September. I mean, th this year has been crazy. You all know that. It, I mean, really what's going on in the world hasn't affected me too much. Um, you know, I got sick. It, it wasn't fun. It wasn't that bad of a deal, but it wasn't fun, and, and there has been lives that have been lost, and that's horrible. It's horrible. Um, but I remember back in September when the, when the Hebrew New Year was switching, you know, we came into the year 5781, and it was in, um, you know, the decade of 5780 was the, the decade of the mouth, the decade of the pay, the mouth. And so in, in 80, it was all about declaration, but in 5781, was uh, it was the year of the silencing of the mouth. That's what the Hebrew year transferred over to in the year of September. And isn't it funny how the muzzles have come out? You know, it really has been a year of silencing. And, uh, and I'm a, I don't know about y'all, but for me, I'm a talker. I was all about the declaration year. But when it was time to be quiet, and the Lord specifically was telling me, not y'all, but because of the way... Sometimes he has to get my attention. He was telling me, Scott, shut up. And, and I didn't heed that advice. I didn't heed that word from the Lord, and I experienced the repercussions of that. I opened my mouth and shared things that maybe it wasn't the right time. Maybe it wasn't the right season. Um, I know it was the Lord. I know it was because his sheep know his voice. Um. But sometimes he shares things with you, and uh, it's not for everybody else. And so I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in a season of learning that, and that's really, really, really difficult. Um, have you ever felt like the Lord has really taken a long time to answer your prayers? Maybe that's just me. <laughs> Maybe that's just me. Well, uh, I want you guys to take heart, because the Lord is the same yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs>
And this is exactly what the people of the Bible felt like when they were waiting on God to send them a Savior. And, and, and that's where we're going to go. We're going to go down this rabbit hole. I'm asking you guys to go down a rabbit hole with me. This, this term came up this morning in, in our prophetic class, uh, and it just made me chuckle. You know, the, the Lord will give you the revelation as much as you want. And if you're not willing to press in, he'll stop where you want to stop. But he's amazingly, he's so much more than we give him credit for. He's so much bigger. We can't even conceive. He is outside of the constraints of time. He is so big. Even when I think I'm doing something crazy, he's like, Psh, that's nothing. And I'm like, well, it is for me. <laughs> Man. So anyway, God promised his people. He promised uh, the people in the Bible, actually, that he promised them that he would send a Messiah, that he would send a Savior to the world. You know, I, I know you guys heard me uh, talking about the Bible being two parts and not Old Testament and New Testament, but actually the Bible in two parts is God created everything perfectly, and then there was the fall. There was a fall in Genesis chapter 3. And then from like Genesis chapter 4, all the way to Revelation 22, it's about redemption and restoration and restoring the Father's ways. That's how the Bible's broke up into two parts. And, uh, you know, we promised that, that he would send a Savior after the fall. <laughs> but for hundreds and hundreds of years, even centuries, think about that. I'm boohooing because God didn't answer me in a week. What about when the Lord says, I'm going to send you a Savior, and then he waits thousands, with an S, thousands of years before he sends a Savior? Huh. But that's okay, because God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Does that mean he's going to make me wait thousands of years? Well, man, that's a long time. One day is like a thousand years. We're getting there. One day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. Isn't that wild? You know, a thousand years is a long time, but is it really? Have you considered a thousand years in the scope of eternity? Not so big then. It's not so big then. So uh, we're going to go all the way back. You know, I just briefly, briefly, briefly was talking about, um, you know, the fall. And so we're actually going to go back there. You guys can, if you want to, turn to Genesis chapter 2. I'm briefly going to paraphrase uh, Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3. And uh, I should probably turn there in my Bible. I, I had all this stuff marked. I need to leave one page here. <laughs> All the way back there in the Bible, the very beginning. Don't you love it how I got to go through like a hundred pages even to get to Genesis chapter 2? Wouldn't you think it'd be right there in the very beginning? That's a hundred pages deep. <laughs> so Genesis chapter 2, you guys know the story. And I'm just going to help you guys rem remind you of it. Um, the Lord created everything, you know, in Genesis chapter 1. And, and uh, God is so good. He's showing me a pattern that he does. You know what he does? He gets everything perfect. Everything perfect. And then he allows us to be there. He created all this stuff in Genesis chapter 1, and when everything was all perfect, then he created man. He wanted everything perfect, and then he created man. Well, anyway, um, you know, man was in the garden, and, and he could see that it wasn't good, so, so the Lord created Took, put Adam to sleep and, and gave him a beautiful lady and, and Adam came back to him and was like, man, this is amazing. And everything was good. They're hanging out with God. They're walking with him in the cool of the day. And, and uh, you know, the, the Lord says, I just got this one thing. I, I just don't want you to eat from this tree, not because I don't want you to not partake in something, but because I want you to live with me forever. I want you to commune with me forever. I want you to fellowship with me forever. And, uh, and, and Eve, Eve and Adam, they were deceived, and so they ate from this fruit, which caused the fall. That caused separation. You know, um, 
And, and, and with that, <clears throat> it's, <laughs> it's just wild. With that. Man, I just, just the deepest part of me just wants to commune with the Lord all, all the time. You know, there's times where it's the sweet spot, and then there's times when it's not the sweet spot, and I spend all my time trying to get back to the sweet spot. Whew. It's just wild. It's just wild. He created us to love him, to fellowship with him, and, and we got duped, and it broke fellowship Now he's taken all the whole rest of the Bible, all the whole rest of the Bible to bring us back to him so that he can reside with us. So we could pick up that story just about anywhere in the Old Testament. Okay, you talk the Old Testament and you could you could go anywhere to find restoration and redemption. But uh, in 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 Genesis chapter three fifteen, this is what scholars. Scholars and theologians say is the first messianic prophecy. It's the first prophecy that the Lord is going to send a Savior after the fall. Okay, and and actually I'll start in 14. It says, I'll read out of the New Living Translation, Genesis 3, 14, out of the New Living Translation. It says, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, you will be punished. You were singled out from all the domestic and wild animals of the whole earth to be cursed. You will grovel in the dust as long as you live, crawling along on your belly. And from now on, you and the woman will be enemies, and your offspring and her offspring will be enemies. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. Theologians and scholars say that that's the first prophecy that the Lord is going to send a Redeemer. I want you to take note that it says, her seed. Her seed. It doesn't say his seed, it says her seed. Now, if you read just about everywhere else in the whole entire Bible, it talks about the seed of a man. But right here, it talks about her seed. Now, you guys got to take that, and you got to put that in your pocket, okay? Now, from that one part where it talks about uh, the seed of a woman is going to be brought forth, we know, we know that that seed is Jesus. See, we get the best of both worlds. We get the Old Testament, and we get the New Testament. We get a big, encompassing picture of what was happened then, but then also what is coming. So, Lord, we thank you for your word. Now, that story of a Messiah coming, we can see types and shadows through the whole entire Bible, a whole, the, through the whole entire Old Testament, all the way till Matthew. And we're going to pick this. We're going to pick this part up: the story of a Messiah coming, the story of uh, of a Savior to humanity. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter seven, verse fourteen. So Isaiah's first prophecy about the Messiah happens approximately 740 years before the birth of Christ. Now, for time's sake, I'm not going to go there, but I went through this big, huge uh, delineation of time and, and, and how we're in the Hebrew year 5781 and how, you know, um, there's actually some strong argument that we're in the year 50. Uh, 5991, and, and you know, there's some teaching, you know, it makes reference in, in the Bible about uh, Elijah's school of the prophets, and so you can make reference to that in the Bible, and then if you want to dig into Elijah's school of the prophets, uh, they taught their prophets in the Old Testament times that the earth will endure for 6,000 years. And there's strong argument that we're actually in the year 5991, and according to their teachings, the Lord will not tarry past the year 6,000. Hence, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord, and a thousand years is like a day. And we can see this, this prototype in the creation. Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, day six, day seven. And um, that 200-year that, that delineation is actually, um, you know, we began keeping the civil calendar from the time Israel was set free from the bondage in Egypt, but they're beginning to discover that actually the calendar started at the birth of Isaac, which is 200 years before. And if that's the case, we're pretty darn close to the coming of the millennial, the thousand years, the thousand year rule and reign on earth as it is in heaven. So even though, with that being said, you know, 
Isaiah begins prophesying. His first prophecy about the coming Messiah is, uh, is Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. I should have been turning there when I was talking. I'm sorry, you guys. You guys probably already read it. And uh, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God is with us. And isn't that ironic considering um, the season that we're in? You know, we celebrate... uh, the coming Messiah for, for Christmas or December 25th. Um, but Rod alluded to actually last week that they actually believe that Jesus was born um, either at the end of September or the beginning of October. He wasn't necessarily born in the winter solstice, that he was actually born in the fall. But what we, uh, as Gentiles, we celebrate December 25th as, as Christmas, as uh, the coming, uh, the, the virgin birth of the Messiah. And so... This poses the question, is uh, what is God doing while they're waiting? So now we got in Genesis chapter 3, thousands and thousands of years ago, um, that, the, that the seed of the woman will, will crush the serpent's head and that he will strike at her heel. I gotta, I've got to stay on my notes because I just learned a whole uh, thing about our heel. When you walk, your heel is your strength. And... Uh, your heel is your strength, and the enemy is always striking at your heel. The enemy is always striking at your strength. Because your strength, your greatest strength is, you know, unfortunately your greatest weakness. Whether you like to admit that or not, it is what it is. And something the Lord was showing me is, is, is I feel like he's given me the ability to lead. And when I'm in a position where I don't get to lead, I struggle. I struggle. And so he started showing me, okay, this is your strength, and the enemy strikes at you at your strength, which actually causes you to stumble. But again, i got to try to stick to my notes because we're not teaching that today. <laughs> so, uh, you know, what's God doing while they're waiting? What is God doing when they're praying? What is God doing when we're praying for healing? What is he doing when we're praying for loved ones or for protection or provision? You know, what was he doing when they were praying to get back into God's good graces? You know, what's going on during this time of waiting? Um, Matthew 19, 26, it says that with God, all things are possible. So with God, all things are possible. If everything is possible for the Lord, why doesn't he do what we ask him to do when we ask him to do it? What is God doing? You know, when he could do something, he could do anything that he wants to do, but he isn't. What's God doing while we're waiting? What's God doing while we're waiting? This is, where, this is where the Lord, as I was putting this together, the Lord really started rocking me. So out of all the things I've taught, this one has probably touched my heart more than any of them. There's nothing better than when you're trying to teach something and the Lord is actually speaking to your heart as you're putting it together. I, I told myself when I would get up here, don't cry, don't cry. Don't cry. Doesn't that sound like a sissy? <laughs> Don't cry. Oh, man. Mm. I want to show you guys that while we're waiting, God is working. That's what's happening. That's what's happening. While we're waiting, God is working. That's the ultimate, that's really the answer. Now, I want everybody to remember that just because God is silent, it doesn't mean that he's absent. Okay? Have I, I? I know that. I know that. But how, how I have fallen into that trap, <laughs> even recently, that just because the Lord is silent, it doesn't mean that he's absent. So uh, Deuteronomy 31.6, it says, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord, your God, goes with you. He will never leave you, and he will never forsake you. Just because the Lord is silent, it doesn't mean that he's absent. I want all of you guys to remember that he is a good father. God is a good father. In Psalm 103, 13, he says, uh, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those that fear him. Okay? 
I fear the Lord. I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I'm not afraid of him because he's my dad, he's my father, but I do fear him because he is, he is, he's awesome. I mean, I can't even, I mean, he could crush me. He could do anything he wants. I mean, I can't even begin to wrap my mind about how awesome God is. And so there is this healthy fear, you know what I'm saying, of him. You know, a lot of times, especially in the Old Testament, when, when, when the Lord would show up to some of these prophets, they would be trembling with fear. You know what I'm saying? And God is good. He's a good, good, good father. And he has compassion on us. You know, Jesus actually come and, and he died for our sins. He, he actually came and, and he made a way to restore relationship with us to the Father. And, and he says there wasn't anything that we can experience that he didn't. You know, he can sympathize with the things that we're going through. And so I want everybody to remember Jeremiah 29, 11. You guys probably all know this by heart. It says, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So when, when I should know this, but I didn't. I, I, I took a beat down here for a while. I know, I know that when the enemy, when Satan was tempting Jesus, Jesus fought the enemy with the word. He did not fight him in silence. He didn't put his lip out and pout and think, poor, poor, pitiful me. Well, I'm a slow learner. So, <laughs> uh, the Lord has good plans for each and one of us. He, 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 wants to, he wants us to have hope. You know, he has a good future planned out for each and every one of us. And I want everybody to rem remember that he loves us. God loves us. He loves us so deeply. Jeremiah 31, 3. It says, The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. The Lord loves us with an everlasting love, and he's constantly drawing us to deeper relationship with him through his kindness. And, and I know that, but good night. Why do, <laughs> why do I fail to remember that it's the goodness, it's the kindness of God that brings men to repentance? He's not afflicting any of us with ridiculousness. He's drawing us with his loving kindness. He's constantly sending brothers and sisters in front of me and, 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 telling, and them telling me that God loves me. It's okay. You got this. Uh, don't give up. And then I find myself asking to ask God to forgive me for not trusting him because I didn't trust him. It's funny. You know that whole, you can't see the forest from the trees. You know, I feel like I know a lot of the word of the Lord inside and out and upside down, forwards and backwards. But in the midst of the fight, oh, how I forget his word. <laughs> it's crazy. I want everybody to remember Romans 8, 28. Paraphrased here. This is paraphrased. You guys can, you can, you can check it out if you want. Um, it says, you know, God is working in all things to bring about good. All things. If it doesn't look good, it ain't the end. If it is not good, it's not the end because God is working all things for the good of those that love him and are called according to his purpose. And if you've asked Jesus into your life, if you've asked him into your heart, if you've asked him to save your soul, if you have a relationship with God Almighty, you're called according to his plans and his purpose. And if you love him, not an option. You know, so, so really what it boils down to is I need to put my place, or I need to put myself in a place of objective truth. And unfortunately, I've, 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 I've fallen to allow my emotions to dictate my thoughts about the Lord. You know, things didn't feel good. Things didn't look good. Things ain't the way that I want them to be. So, Lord, you must not love me. You don't care about me. You're not hearing my prayers. See, I need to, we all need to constantly place ourselves in a place where the objective truth is his word is more than my emotions. If we can live from that place, we will forever be victorious. There won't be a battle. 
there won't be a battle. Just because we don't see something happening, it doesn't mean that he's not doing anything. <sighs> I feel so convicted when I'm sharing that, when I'm saying this stuff. It makes me just want to stop because I have so partaken in this. I so entertained the lies of the enemy, and I've so dealt with the consequences of it. So 740-ish, I did a bunch of research on it. Some of them say 738, some say 739, some say 740 and a half, so I just decided to say 740-ish. <laughs> so 740-ish years later, Isaiah, Isaiah's prophecy is fulfilled in Matthew 123. Matthew 123 says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted is God with us. Way back here, 740 years earlier, Isaiah said that this is going to happen. I mean, the terminology that he uses, this is what you will call him, Emmanuel. And then an angel of the Lord shows up and tells Mary, <laughs> you're going to call this dude Emmanuel. And that's what she does. It blows me away. It blows me away. So what's God doing while I'm waiting? He's working, right? What's God doing while you're waiting? Is he being mean? <laughs> Is he punishing you? You didn't do what he said? You didn't act the way that he wanted you to act? Is that how God works? Doesn't his word say that it's the goodness of God that brings man to repentance? Hmm. So briefly, I want to talk about what's called the intertestamental period. Isn't that a fun word? Intertestamental. I liked writing that down. It's a word about this big. The intertestamental, many, the intertestamental period. <laughs> this is the span of 400 years from the end of the book of Malachi to the book of Matthew. Some of you guys probably know that. I didn't know that's what it was called. I knew there was a long time where there wasn't much being said, but I didn't know it had a name. Well, now I know that it has a name. So during this 400-year period, the Lord was silent. Now, there are so many prophecies in the Bible that it's ridiculous. It's ridiculously awesome. It's not bad at all. And what I was just sharing with you guys, you know, the, the first prophecy in Genesis 3.15, and then I just happened to pick Isaiah, you know, for chapter 7, verse 14, and then, and then I could show the fulfillment of it in, in Matthew, you know, chapter 1, uh, verse 23, and and then, but at the time, you know what I mean? There are so many other uh, prophecies in here, some that have been fulfilled, some that haven't. And I think I'm driving, I think I'm driving down, driving home the point that what do we do? What's he doing when I'm waiting? And what am I doing when he's waiting? What am I doing when he's waiting? Well, I tell you what I've been doing. I've been playing poor, poor, pitiful me. And everybody hates me, and I suck, and I don't want to do Christianity no more. And this is horrible. I am going to go back to self-medication. Yay! <laughs> and then the Lord's like, hmm. Then the Lord sends me my buddy Nathan, and he's like, dude, get it together. And I'm like, yes, sir. <laughs> oh, goodness. Um. Well, before we take a look at this, the, before we take a look at what happened in the intertestamental period, I want to bring a little context to the picture that we're going to paint. The picture that we're going to paint is God's timing. Okay, God's timing is talked about in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. It's actually chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, but I think I'm just going to read uh, Galatians chapter 4. I'm so, yeah, because I have so many markers. <laughs> so anyway, um, Galatians 4, 4, it says, But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law that might receive the adoption of sons. So, so this is a key. This is a key to what happens. This is the key to sometimes why the Lord doesn't answer us right away. This is a key to, uh, you know, what he could be doing while we're waiting and even a key to what uh, we should be doing while he's waiting. Did I say that right? What he's doing while I'm waiting, and then what I'm doing while he's waiting. Okay. When the fullness of time has come, 
Then he sent his son. You know, this, this, this reminds me of my, my beautiful bride who's up there running, running that stuff. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> it reminds me of my beautiful bride when she was pregnant. And even when she was at nine months old, she was uncomfortable. I don't know if any of y'all ladies can relate, but uh, when you're coming near the end of uh, the, t- the third term there of your pregnancy, you're just ready for it to be done. And uh, she was just like that. But it didn't matter. You know, uh, Tristan couldn't come because the fullness of the term hadn't yet been there. But let me tell you what. When her water broke, there was no stopping it. It was happening. It was happening. No ifs, ands, or buts. So the context is when the fullness of time comes, you cannot stop what the Lord has ordained. I can't make it go no faster, and I can't slow it down. And I'm having to chew on that. I say that, and I hear that, and I comprehend that. I understand that. But I'm actually in the process of living that out. Because I feel like the Lord is showing me some amazing stuff. But I think he's showing it to me so that I can prepare for it. He's showing it to me, and I'm trying to show it to other people. And all this craziness is happening. Miscommunication, misconceptions, hurt feelings, attitudes, frustrations, want to strangle each other. Like real brothers and sisters, which is great. You know what I'm saying? But it, it's not time. The Lord is showing me. He's telling me, hey, dude, you're trying to have the baby, and the baby ain't ready to be have. I told you that the ba- you had the baby. You had the baby. Now figure out how to handle the baby. Work with the baby. Grow the baby. Love the baby. Feed the baby. Change the baby. But don't give the baby away. And I'm like, oh, wow. Well, I wish that didn't take three months, four months to figure out. (sighs) (laughs) Again, slow learner. Slow learner. So uh, it's the same with God. You know, if it's his time, if it's not in his time, we can't make nothing happen. But when it's his time, when it's the fullness of time, there's nothing. Not you, not me, not an angel, not Satan, not anything that can stop the plans and the purposes of God. And so since hindsight is 2020, oh yeah, totally hindsight. Since hindsight's 2020, let's take a look at what the Lord was doing in the intertestamental period. Now you can't find this stuff in the Bible um, where I found this information. Uh, if you're interested in taking a look at it, you can just get on YouTube and you can type in intertestamental period and there will be two 30-minute sessions. If you're interested in watching it, check it out. It's super cool if you're a history buff, uh, but what we've done is kind of pulled the, the points, you know what I mean, the mains out of it and kind of kind of brought them, brought, them into, uh, brought them into this teaching. And, and I think that when you see what was happening during this 400 period of time of silence, you will really clearly see what the Lord was doing. So the first thing, um, the first thing that happened, uh, the first major thing that happened was Alexander the Great was a Greek. He conquered the entire world in 12 years. Conquered the whole world in 12 years. But I can do it in 11. (laughs) He conquered the whole world in 12 years. And uh, what's that matter to us? Well, for the first time since the Tower of Babel, or Babel, Tower of Babel, (laughs) for the first time since the Tower of Babel, Um, there was somewhat of a common language. Because the Greeks conquered the whole entire world, there was all, every nationality began to understand or comprehend or speak just a little bit of Greek. Not that they were fluent, but there was a worldwide beginning to understand uh, of a language. Um, The second important thing that happened during this 400 period of time was that the Old Testament was translated into Greek around 280 B.C. The Old Testament. The Old Testament, which means a lot of people now had access to the Word of God and the prophecies about the coming Messiah. It went just from a couple of people having it and teaching it, um, you know, in their synagogues or, or just specifically the Jewish people having it, to now it's translated and everybody can begin to hear, can begin to learn, um, can begin to piece some things together. The third important thing that happened during this 400 period, uh, 400 year period was what's called a Socratic method of learning came forth. Okay, a Socratic method 
of learning was uh, the opportunity to ask questions. There was a time where that wasn't an option. You got told what you got told, and you didn't get to question it. This is the truth. Take it or leave it. It kind of reminds me of when my kids were little. You do it because I said so. <laughs> and uh, so this was a, I, I, this behooved me. This blew me away. I was like, wait a minute. There was, you mean you just take people for their word? Like that, what a level of trust, right? But th this was a period of time where, uh, where dialogue became acceptable instead of monologue. You know, it kind of reminds me of like, I hate to say it, but like the caveman era, like you, Jane, come here, you, my wife. Not an option. Now it's like, mm, I don't think so, homeboy. I don't like you. <laughs> so so, so uh, the, the third thing was the, was the Socratic method of learning begins. Uh, the fourth thing was that in 63 BC, the Romans conquered the Greeks. So this was a weird time when the Romans conquered the Greeks. There was a weird time that the Roman Empire experienced peace. And while they was experiencing peace, there was a time where they, because there was no war, you know, the Roman Empire was like the greatest warring empire to ever grace the face of the earth. They were amazing, for real. But when they weren't warring, what were they doing? Building. You got it. They were building. And so what did they do is they began to build roads they begin to, for lack of better terms, highways. You know, they created modes of transportation from city to city that didn't take ridiculous amounts of time. And so what does that matter? It's, it's an opportunity for God's word. It, it made God's word to be able to go forth with easier means of transportation, easier, you know, quickly, quickly. So one of the last things that happened during this time was called the diaspora. Does anybody know what that is? We've got a couple people that know what that is. So the di diaspora was, was a moment, was a period in time where the Jewish people were not allowed to be, not allowed to live in Israel, or I'm sorry, in Jerusalem specifically. And so the Jewish people who, as the New Testament says, what's so special about the Jewish people is they've been entrusted the oracles of God. They were entrusted the secrets of God. So they had his word. Not only did they have written word now, but they had the oral word. It was passed down from generation to generation. And so these people that had the word of God in their hearts were dispersed throughout the world, throughout all of the Roman world initially, but eventually to the Gentile world as well. That's a benefit for probably most of you guys and for me. You know what I'm saying? So because of the diaspora, it was another explosion of God's word going out, okay? Are you guys all following that? So when you add all of this up, you begin to see the what are you doing while we were waiting. So while we was waiting on this Messiah to come, the Lord was creating avenues in which people could be brought forth the message, the good news, the good news of, of, of the Messiah, of our Savior, Jesus Christ, or Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach. You know, depending on what part of the world you're in. You know what I'm saying? So, and just in that same pattern, it's the same thing in our lives. Okay? I mean, suddenly people could read God's word in a language that they could understand. I got a bunch of Bibles right. I got, I got a bunch of Bibles right now. I got, I, got, I got Aramaic versions that I can't understand. I got Hebrew versions that I can't understand. Now, even though there's letter and letter, you know, paragraph to paragraph, I don't fully understand. And so I couldn't imagine trying to read God's Word in, I don't even know, I don't even, can't even think of a language, Haitian, you know, what well, was Creole, Creole, yep, slang French, yep, I couldn't imagine that. So, <clears throat> for the first time... Um, they were not only allowed to, but encouraged to ask questions to a God who was about to send the answer to their questions, which was Jesus. You guys follow that? Out of nowhere, for the first time in history, the good news of a Savior could travel through a common language, across newly formed roads, through Jewish people that are spread throughout the entire Roman world. You know, that this is what the Lord was doing while God's people were waiting he was working. While it didn't seem like anything was going on, he was setting the table. He was setting the stage. 
And at just the right time, what did Galatians 4.4 say? At just the right time, he sent the Savior. Man, God, you're so good. I'm glad you don't take my counsel. I'm glad you don't give me what I want when I want it. Because if you give it to me premature, what happens when a baby comes prematurely? I mean, by the grace of God, we got amazing medical facilities and amazing doctors. And so many times they go to the, to the what is it, the NICU, and they, get, they, get, they, they, they live. But I mean, without that, premature babies usually means death. And so if the Lord gives us something before he's prepared everything... It reminds me of the little child that has the bunny that wants to hold it so tight, just won't let it go. And then eventually, hmm, she held it too tight. <laughs> Was that a bad analogy? Sorry, Michael. <laughs> uh, all right. Um, In the same way, when you're praying, when you're waiting and you're hoping and you're believing, because that's what I've been doing. I mean, things have not been going good, and I've been just believing for a breakthrough, and I've been hoping for a breakthrough, and I've been doing everything that I know how to do, except for fight the enemy with the Lord's word. <laughs> I've been doing everything that I know how to do to just hang on. I'm telling, I am telling you, hanging on by a thread. Like, this just isn't, I didn't sign up for this. I'm responsible to the Lord for my salvation. That's it. To interact with other humans sometimes is a stretch for me. <laughs> Sorry. It, it is what it is. And uh, obviously some other people are like that too. So uh, <laughs> some of us right now, are, or maybe some of us are in the same place. You know, maybe we're in a holding pattern. Maybe, uh, maybe you're waiting. Maybe you're believing. Maybe you're doing everything that you know how to do. Maybe you're trusting God. A God that says that he can, but he hasn't. You know, how do you hang on? You know, you, you might be wondering. I know I was wondering. <laughs> I, I was just coming out of it. So I was wondering some of these exact things. Lord, what have I done wrong? <laughs> Lord, what have I done wrong? Have I failed? Have I failed you? The things that you told me, did I mess it up to the point where it can't be used? Is there sin in my life? I mean, you do. When, when, when things ain't going my way, I do a big internal check. Like, psh, psh, what am I doing? Am I watching TV? Am I doing this? Have I flipped anybody off or cutting me off? What's going on, Lord? Um, is there a lack of faith? In, is, is there a lack in my faith? Am I not believing? You know, have I turned away? Have I, have I lost hope in the goodness of God? You know, and, I, and I've even had the thought, and unfortunately, it is what it is. Lord, do you even care? I mean, the despair, the depression, the not understanding. Thanks, Nathan. I appreciate you, man. Oh, dude. If you're waiting, you're not alone. The woman with the issue of blood waited 12 years in private agony. 12 years. It wasn't just that she was, had an issue of blood. I mean, that, that had catastrophic consequences to her lifestyle. She couldn't even be around people. In that, in that day and age, if, 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 you was, if you were unclean, you couldn't fellowship, you couldn't talk, you couldn't be around people, you couldn't be part of the community. For 12 years, this woman was in agony until she touched Jesus. The man at the pool of Bethesda, he waited 38 years. 38. 38 years. I couldn't imagine. I couldn't imagine seeing this pool, seeing an angel of the Lord store up, stir up the pool. There's movement in the water, and this other cat gets in. Boy, I'd be a rageaholic. Like if one more person gets in there before me, 38 years he watched other people get healed before he encountered Jesus. Blows me away, too. I've got to stay on my notes. It blows me away. Jesus says, do you want to be made well? And he gives him an excuse. 
Lord, I've been trying, but everybody gets in the piece. I didn't ask you if you've been trying. I asked you if you want to be made well or not. <laughs> Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years to hold Isaac. And I was talked about this in class earlier. I'm so guilty of this. I hear the Lord. It doesn't happen when I think it should happen, so I try to make it happen. You know what I'm saying? And uh, is that not what Abraham and Sarah did? You know, that they... Hmm. They created a mess. You know, and uh, forever those brothers, even to this day, are still warring because of what man tried to do and what God had ordained. Um, this one here probably, probably hits home with me the most is uh, Joseph. Joseph had a dream to lead his family, to save a nation. You know, he waited 13 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. Oh, I've learned so much stuff about all this stuff. I, I, learned that, I learned that, you know, I learned that he was in jail for a year for every brother that he brought a bad report back to his father. Is that not astonishing? Does that, does that not, is that not wild? The Lord held him accountable for the bad report that he brought to his father a year for every one of his brothers. Is that not wild? And, um, and you know, if you keep going through that story of Joseph, you can see that he learned from his mistake. He gave him a bad report, and he, and he paid for that. And then when his brothers came to get food, when, when he was overseeing Egypt during the famine, you know, he could have, and, and he revealed himself to his brothers. He said, you know, hey, I'm alive. And, and he was actually going to go see his father, uh, you know, before he passed away. His father was going to come see him, all, all that good stuff. He could have told his dad, yeah, my brother sold me into slavery, but he learned the lesson. You know, and love covers a multitude of sins. He learned to love. It took him 13 years to learn that lesson. Lord, please don't let me be that hard-headed. I mean, I can so relate to Joseph on so many levels. God gives an awesome dream to a 17-year-old boy, and he does this. And the Lord goes, we're going to have to temper this young man. We're going to lock him up. I don't know how he didn't squirm and kick and cry. Oh, God, you don't love me? Because <laughs> I would have. Um, I want you to understand that just because he hasn't doesn't mean that he's not going to answer your prayers. Okay? Um, God's delays aren't necessarily God's denials. You know? Just because he takes a little bit of time to make sure that everything's right doesn't mean that he's against you. Maybe it's just not time yet. Maybe it just ain't ready yet. Maybe you ain't ready yet. This is, this is a hard pill. This is a hard pill for me to swallow. I don't know about y'all, but I'm the best of the best. I'm the best that ever lived. Ask my wife. Um, but maybe I'm not ready yet. Maybe I'm not ready to lead where the Lord wants me to lead. Maybe he's got to. Maybe he's got to change my attitude, change my thought process. In fact, I know he does. I know he does. We had an incident this week, and and a, and a lady took it upon herself to um, cuss out my daughter. And uh, you want to talk about a. You want to talk about a. You want to talk about an issue. You there was you know a couple of days where I don't think I was sanctified at all. And uh, you know that old man tried to come back. Thank the good Lord he didn't let me find this lovely person. Um, but now I'm not that excited. That sounds great to say, but now I'm not excited because I know I failed the test. You know, I'm going to get that opportunity again. It might not happen at that capacity, but I'm going to get the opportunity again to not respond in my flesh. Isn't that exciting? Better me than you, huh? Um... <laughs> while you're waiting on it, I got quotation marks, it. I don't know what your it is. I know what my it is, but I don't know what your it is. You know, maybe you're waiting for a miracle. Maybe that's your it. You know, I can put myself in that category. My, my lovely bride's been uh, fighting shingles. You know, she went through an eight-month bout where it was great, and here, here recently it flared up all on her face, and it was just a bad deal. Of course, you know, right at family time. 
just the most unopportune times. We're, we're, we're believing the Lord, you know, His Word. We're standing on His Word. His Word says, by your stripes, by His stripes, the Lord was whipped on our behalf for our healings. And I'm believing that the Lord is going to heal my wife's face. Has it happened yet? No. Am I going to stand on the Word of the Lord? Yes. I'm going to do what I can know how to do. You know, it's easy to have faith for somebody else. It's hard to have faith for me. Uh, maybe you're waiting on an answer. You know, maybe you've just asked the Lord, should I stay or should I go? You know, maybe you're just, what should I do? You're just waiting on the Lord to answer and you haven't heard anything. Maybe you're waiting on provision. You know, maybe you're in a financial bind and, uh, you know, maybe the Lord needs to provide and you're waiting on that. Whatever it is, God is still working on it. I promise you that. I just want you guys to know that. Whatever it is, God is working on it. Hmm. Maybe God isn't working on it because maybe we're not ready. Maybe God is working on you to be ready, and maybe he's doing something in you. Maybe he's doing something in me. I know he is. I know he is. When you put yourself in the vulnerable vulnerable situation, when you put yourself into the potter's hands, he's going to mold you. He's going to work you. And you know what? Just when you think you got it all figured out, you get shattered and you get reworked into something a little more beautiful. I don't know how many times that's going to happen, <laughs> but I feel like he's made me into about 50 different vases so far. <laughs> Maybe we can do a coffee cup this time. something I'm in the process of learning. I thought I already knew it, but I'm figuring out that I'm still in the process of learning is many times God does something in me before he does something for me and definitely before he does something through me. You know, long time I wanted to be up here and teach. Many years I had to sit and not teach. And then I had to teach little crowds before I could teach bigger crowds. And now I'm teaching decent crowds. I know eventually I'm going to get to teach bigger crowds. But you've got to crawl before you can walk. You know, there's a lot of things that I just did and said in here that I probably wouldn't stay, say in front of a stadium full of people. You know, what, what, what's your it? What's your it? What's the Lord doing in you? You know, you know I lost my cool a couple days ago and wanted to snatch this lady up. That's something the Lord's got to get out of me because he can't, I can't represent him and his kingdom if that's in me. You know, what, what, what's, what's it for you? You know, I, I don't need you to answer, but I'm sure that all of us have areas that we need to work on. Um, so don't waste the waiting, okay? The entire purpose of our waiting is to learn to trust our Father. That's the whole purpose. I had to repent because I didn't trust God. I thought I did, but I didn't. I thought I knew better than him. I wasn't allowing him to be God, you know? Do any of y'all got kids? Now, I got a kid who's 21 years old, and when he tries to tell me he knows more than me, <laughs> he knows a lot. He's good. He's awesome. But I'm still your dad. And I wonder if the Lord felt that way about me. You know what I'm saying? When, when the Lord had a plan, and we were working the plan, and it was going good, and everything was great, I'm like, yeah, my dad's awesome. My dad can beat up your dad. And then one day I'm like, you know what? I know more than dad. I want to do it my way. And the Lord's like, uh-uh. Ain't happening, Captain. Hmm. I'm thankful for his grace. I'm thankful for his mercy. I'm thankful that he surrounded me with brothers and sisters that have grace for me. I'm thankful that he surrounded me with brothers and sisters that can see my blind spots. And uh, I don't know, God, you're just good. You're good. So, uh, you know, the entire purpose of waiting on the Lord is to learn how to trust Him. It, it's to learn how to depend on Him in a way that I never have before. It's learning to depend on Him in a way that you never had before. And I can tell you right now, it's going to be the spot that you want to hold on to. You know, I know my capabilities, but I don't fully know His. And so for me to trust fully that He has this under control... It's hard for me to do. I mean, I'm just being honest. You know, it's, uh, you know, another purpose of the waiting is it's for him to reveal his faithfulness to us. 
I was rocked by the worship songs today. You know, his faithfulness to us. You know, he started a good work in you, and you, and you, and you, and you. He started a good work in me, and he's faithful to himself to complete it. God, you're so good. Don't waste the waiting. Don't waste the waiting. I would like to propose... I'm going, to, I'm going to go through this last part quick. I've got a few minutes left. I would like to propose that the waiting is actually an opportunity for the endurance of our faith to grow. The Lord's been talking to me for this over the course of the last month is James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. I'll click on over there. Click. Ha! That's funny. I'll read it to you real quick. Um. It says, Dear brothers and sisters, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be strong in character and ready for anything. Okay? I like to, I like to read that, and that all sounds great. I'll, I'll read it over here in the King James. It says, But brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith work is patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting for nothing. The Lord's really been rocking me on the, I got it wrote down here, is, is uh, verse 4a. And in this New Living Translation, it says, so let it grow. So let it grow. It says, uh, whenever trouble comes your way, let it be an opportunity for joy. For when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. My faith in God, my trust in Him, that He has all this under control. This is an opportunity for my endurance, for my faith to gather endurance. And so he says, right, he says, so let it grow. And I found myself not letting it grow. I find myself in the trial and I'm trying to pull back. I'm trying to get myself out of the storm. I'm looking for cover. I'm trying to run away from everything that's given me any kind of adverse conditions just so that I could find a peace, just so I could find his peace, not understanding. And I know this stuff, not understanding that the whole goal was for me to find peace during the storm. Find peace in the midst of the trial. Let it grow. He's telling me to stand firm. Let it grow. It's in the hurricane that the trees are either ripped up or the roots go down. You know what I'm saying? Did we build on the foundation of Christ or do we build on the foundation of shifting sand? Let it grow. This is what the Lord's telling me. Let it grow. And I'm like, oh, well, that sounds good. <laughs> um, we'll close with this. We're going to close with uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. And the Lord's just been blessing me. Blessing me, bless me. I'm going to read this to you guys. Um, you can turn there if you want or not. Um. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Whoa. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9. It says, But it is written, Eye has not seen, nor ear has heard, neither have entered into the heart of a man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. That sounds cool, huh? Those that love him. And you guys know that 80% of the New Testament is actually just the Old Testament rewritten. So I've read that a hundred times. I can't tell you how many times I've heard that, and it just makes me excited. But this is actually a scripture that's quoted out of Isaiah 64, verse 4. So let's go over there and take a look at it, because right here it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined the things that the Lord has prepared for those that love Him. Now if you jump over here in its original, I shouldn't say original, because this isn't Hebrew. <laughs> but in the first version, Isaiah 64, 4, it says, For since the beginning of the world, men have not heard, nor perceived by the ear, neither nor I seen, O God, beside thee that has prepared for him that waits on him. It's funny how that one word changes. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined on those that love God. Now when you come over here into the Old Testament, it says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has imagined those that wait on God. It's all about His perfect timing. It's all about His perfect timing. Waiting 
on God. To wait on God is to love God. To show love for God is to wait on God. To trust him and understand he's a good father. He knows the plans that he has for you. He loves you. To wait on God, that's to show your love for him. And so the Lord's been teaching me about waiting. He's been teaching me about perfect timing. He's been teaching me that he's preparing the table for me in the presence of my enemies. He's been teaching me that he's waiting on me to lay some things down at the foot of the cross and pick up his ways. And I just ask you guys, with all of the stories that have been told, where do you see yourself in this picture? Are you waiting on the Lord to answer your prayers? Don't give up hope because he's making everything just right. And at just the right time, he's going to answer your prayers. Okay? And don't, you know, if you've been waiting on a long time and he hasn't answered your prayers, I would highly consider you look inside yourself. Maybe it's already prepared and he's waiting on you to change before he gives you what he has already prepared for you. Maybe you don't even know Jesus. Maybe you don't even know this Father, this God, this, this, this relationship that I'm talking about, this ability to trust him, this, this God that says he loves me, this God that says with him all things are possible, but he hasn't yet moved on your behalf. If that's the case, he wants to meet you, he wants to love you, he wants to introduce himself to you. If that's the case, I would ask you to ask him into your heart. Ask him. Say, Lord, I want a relationship like that with you. Lord, I want to be able to trust you. Lord, I ask that you would fix me. Lord, I ask that you would unravel the issues of my life and put me back together. (laughs) This has been a picture This whole teaching has been a picture of an intimate relationship with God. Now, God has a relationship with most of you guys in here. I don't know to what level. Some of you guys have deeper relationships than I do with him. Some of you guys have lesser relationships than I do with him. But I'm telling you right now, eternity is a long time. And he loves you. He's never going to stop working on you. He's never going to stop caring for you. He's never going to stop pushing you because he knows there's greatness inside of you. God himself is dwelling within you. You are the tabernacle. You are the tent in which his spirit dwells. We're just waiting on the fullness to be manifest. So, with that being said, we're going to close in prayer. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for today. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to share your word. We thank you for situations and circumstances that you put before us, Heavenly Father, because you believe in us, because you are faithful to yourself. You are faithful to complete the work on which you have begun. And Lord, we just ask that you would help us to surrender to you. Lord, I ask that you would help us to surrender to your plans, your purposes. Lord, I ask that you would ah, just strengthen us. Lord, we silence the lies of the enemy right now in Jesus' name. Lord, we ask that you would magnify your voice that you would magnify your voice, Lord, and that we would help to make applicable the words that you share with us. Lord, we ask for a fresh encounter of your Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth, the comforter, Spirit of truth. We give you permission as we go through this week that you would bring these things to our remembrance, that you would help us lay down our cares, our frustrations, our concerns at the foot of the cross. Lord, help us with the revelation that your burden is light. Lord, help us to bring honor and glory to you in all that we do. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. God bless you guys.